manhood and womanhood. Have we gotten it all wrong? Let's talk about it with Amy Bird on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome Steve Brown, etc. And I'm the aforementioned old white guy. And uh, as always, you always have a place at your at our table. And, and we are so glad that you're here. And you're going to be so glad that you're here, too. Going to be a dynamite program. Matthew Porter, our executive producer, is here. <laughs> Matthew had a joke about women, but his wife said he couldn't use it. So, so here we are. In fact, you said something funny in an email to me, and I cautioned you. And I'm sure that your wife, Stephanie, did. I do not have any jokes that make women the butt of the joke, just to be absolutely <laughs> clear. <laughs> Our video director and one-man IT department, John Myers, is in his tech bunker. And our producer, Jinx, is in his little glass booth. And together, they are the eyes and the ears and the conscience of Steve Brown, etc. Wow, that's a lot Wait, of pressure. Which one of us has to be the heavy conscience? burden to bear. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. George Bingham is the president of Key Life. George uh, wants you to know that Key Life accepts cash, credit, and checks. Just about the only money we can't take is sand dollars and if he can monetize that send it anyway and we'll try and kathy wyatt is the soft feminine side of the program at the marriage supper of the lamb look around for kathy <laughs> chances are she will have brought cupcakes <laughs> and amy just so you know that is not sexist it is factual she makes she cupcakes to die for. Nice. And when she's in a good mood and we've done something that pleases her, that is the reward that we get. Far greater than crowns in heaven will be the cupcakes. All right. We'll be allowed <laughs> to make. Enough, enough, enough. <laughs> he whiz. Amy Bird is an author, speaker, and thinker. She blogs for the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals. She co-hosts, and I love this title, and you ought to check it out, Mortification of Spin podcast <laughs> with Carl Truman. I actually, I probably should interrupt and say I don't co-host that anymore. Did you say uh, something to offend everybody? <laughs> I, I did, actually. I wrote this book. I mean, did they, <laughs> they kick you off or did you leave voluntarily? They let me go. Both. Wow. <laughs> you poorly. We're sorry. We'll fix it. Yeah, I'm, yeah we'll, we'll fix, fix it. it. You'll really be in trouble <laughs> then, Amy. And so yeah, I don't anything write else that you're still on. I don't write for the Alliance of Confessing Evangelicals anymore because they employ the mortification of spin. Okay. Ooh. But let me finish. Amy has written <laughs> several books. <laughs> to make sure she gets kicked off everything else. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, <laughs> no Little Women and Theological Fitness and her latest book, Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, How the Church Needs to Rediscover Her Purpose. You ought to get this book. I'm holding it in my nicotine-stained fingers. Amy. Um, by the way, I'm the father of two daughters and three granddaughters. That's because mm. Jesus likes me. <laughs> I don't have a single boy in the mix. <laughs> I have a wife and all those women that surround me. So I've been fixed. I mean, you're very <laughs> fortunate. I mean, this is, book is not for me. I, uh, I have very strong women who straighten out my sexist views, not misogynistic. I am kind, uh, affirming, and I'm also good looking. And, uh, <laughs> and I do, but I do also have a good voice. And I don't want to talk about it anymore because my natural humility 
sometimes gets in the work. Uh, listen, uh, Amy, I'm, I've been reading your book this morning, and uh, I really like it. It's um, it's good. You're not trying to make me into a woman or make women into a men. You, uh, uh, you have another purpose. We've really screwed it up, haven't we? And we do it in a lot of areas. It's not just this area. The cultural mix in which we live so often cuts the legs off truth and the gospel and biblical revelation. And it certainly has in the idea of biblical manhood and womanhood. Tell us, tell us where the book came from. I'd be interested in your own story. I think I'd like your husband a lot, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, I think I'd like to hear your story and why this um, why this book comes out of that soil. Yeah, so I married fresh out of college, 21 years old, and um, both my husband and I came from broken homes. Our parents divorced, and so I, I really had a desire to have a faithful, loving, biblical marriage. And so I start, you know, reading the books. <laughs> I want to be a good wife. I want to have a good family. And I want to be a good, quote unquote, Christian. So, um, you know, it wasn't long before I got married that the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood uh, came to be as a parachurch organization. And they were writing in response to, um, you know, a lot of the sexual revolution going on in the culture and also what they called evangelical feminism that they saw in the church. So I thought that, you know, the intentions looked good there and, and who doesn't want to be biblical, you know? So I, I, you know, sign me up. I want to be a biblical woman. So I start reading their resources and they have a book called recovering biblical manhood and womanhood. And um, it, originally it was blue and it was kind of referred to as the blue Bible. Um, you know, it just really spread across denominations and evangelicalism. Um, these teachings on what it means to be a biblical man and what it means to be a biblical woman. However, um, you know, some of the things and these are from, you know, teachers that I've pastors and writers that I've learned a lot from before. But um, I was kind of taken aback by some of their teaching on what manhood and womanhood uh, is for them. And yet at the same time, I was 21 years old. So I thought, I, I don't know more than, than these godly people. And so, um, you know, I kind of endeavored in that direction and what they call complementarianism, which was really a movement that they started at the time. And I became a writer myself as I was just trying to explore like what it means to be a disciple. Like if, if I take this whole Christian uh, confession seriously, like what is the life of a disciple like? And so I've I've written several books. This is my fifth book, and um, each one is kind of layered off of the the other one. Other questions that I was looking for answers and couldn't find a book for, and I found that as a woman and and working in the reformedish evangelical subculture. I was um, really finding some obstacles, a lot of invisible fences. Um, we'll say one thing about all disciples and the value of women, but then I found that um, when, when we actually try to contribute our voice or maybe even ask questions or say that, you know, maybe this over here, what you're saying is wrong, um, we were treated very differently. And that it really all was under a rubric of authority, male authority, um, based on, you know, his whole ontology, his whole being and essence of who he is and, and woman as submissive to, to male authority. So that is what I'm challenging in this book. And I'm really trying to um, speak to other disciples. This isn't really about who can be ordained in the church as important of a topic that is I'm writing in just what it means as a disciple, as a man and as a woman and you know, how that affects the way that we read scripture um, what do we see with the male and female voice in scripture? And what does it mean about our uh, great honor and responsibility to one another um, in God's household? You know, I can see where that comes from and where you are. I, you know, if you could play that role that had been assigned to you, mm -hmm. which I suspect was very close to impossible. Uh, you knew you had gifts. You knew you had things to say. Um, 
you wanted to be challenged. You wanted to discuss it and be a part of the discussion, but the fence was too high. Um, there are two things I'm going to ask you about. How did you deal with your anger? I suspect it was spitting anger. And how do you deal once you got it right with the self-righteousness that so easily follows? Mm. Now, that's not a charge. I'm just yeah. saying you're. I would say um, besides prayer and, and good support system and friendships, which are all very important and um, taking my local church very seriously, um, writing. <laughs> writing is how I deal with a lot of that. So, um, you know, writing the book really helped me. It's not just, oh, let's point out and critique what this water that we're all swimming in, but um, there's something much more beautiful in God's word. And so that not only uh, take, turns your anger into joy, but it also totally humbles you to see that, there, you know, we're just scratching the surface. Um, there's so much more for us to discover. And, and that's very exciting. We're talking with uh, Amy Bird, recovering from biblical manhood and womanhood. Uh, underline the from, how the church needs to rediscover her purpose. This is going to be an important discussion for all of us as we look at the really neat stuff that God has for all of us, male and female. This is very hard work. So we're going to take a nap, rest up while we sell some product. But like Jesus, we're going to return. with author and speaker Amy Bird about her new book. It's called Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, How the Church Needs to re Rediscover Her Purpose. Amy, uh, in, in, in reading through the book, uh, any kind of problem that comes, uh, you know, whether it's uh, deals with sex or race or anything else, my brain immediately goes to trying to extract um, what, what's the actual problem? Is this, is this isolated incident? Is this systemic? Is this institutional trying to kind of throw my arms around the whole thing? So toward that end is, is the, is the problem that you're pointing out? Um, is it where somebody takes tradition that was inspired by scripture and then just kind of uh, codifies it and then starts conflating it with scripture itself? Or is, is that kind of oversimplifying what our challenge is? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty layered and complicated because yeah. I say, you know, we can go all the way back to Aristotle and have, you know, this whole sex polarity and um, you know, the female as the deformed male kind of, you know, and how that is, evolve and go through the Victorian age and, and see, you know, this whole problem as well. Um, so, you know, you can see some of that kind of is rebirthed in this whole movement of biblical manhood and womanhood. Um, but, and I, and I also think that, that there's this perfect storm going on of, of wanting to, the, you know, the church wanting to respond to all the chaos, the sexual chaos in our culture, which we, we should do as a prophetic voice. But I think, um, instead of, um, getting to the heart of the meaning and value of our, you know, behind our sexuality and the actual body, like story that our bodies tell, um, it, it, it gets boiled into these or reduced, I should say, into these stereotypes of our culture. And also it's led by fear. And, and so we've swung this pendulum over and we're still very one dimensional. So I think there's a lot of layers to how we've gotten where we've gotten. Um, in the book, I use this um, metaphor of the yellow wallpaper um, that I borrowed from a, a novella from the 1800s. Um, and it's a metaphor that kind of symbolizes what I what I use it to symbolize is like blind spots that we have as a church that's all around us 
um, that we don't even realize it's there. So if we peel it back, you know, and, and go back to God's word and, and we're going to see something much more beautiful, um, in his whole word in the whole canon of scripture, because I think another layer to this is like a biblicist reading of scripture where we take this line here and we take this line here and we kind of strip it out of the context of the whole canon of scripture. And then we develop whole theologies around it about manhood and womanhood. We do that about a lot of things, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not just here. I mean, you could, we could spend uh, untold programs discussing how, we sell out and conform to culture and tradition. And, you know, Paul had some really serious things to say about that. And uh, so did Jesus. Um, and uh, so at any rate, good for you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Amy, um, one thought that kind of came to mind, and I'm not sure that this uh, gets at a direction necessarily, but uh, just as you're talking about the problem, and I think we, and as Steve said, we, we have those kind of problems in a lot of areas. We have this tendency, especially as, uh, you know, as believers, but as humans, that we sort of get to the, just give me the rules, tell me what to do, so I know how to act and how to be and those kind of things is is that part of the original problem or the the basic problem i mean are we putting whether whether it was in the right direction or not for example whether uh, the uh, biblical manhood has been described properly or you know it's it has errors in it that you such as you point out are we putting too much emphasis on trying to define biblical manhood so we know the rules uh, regardless of what they are so we can try and be that? I mean, it's almost yeah. the risk of becoming too pharisaical, mm -hmm. whichever way we choose it. Yeah, that's definitely another layer to it. It's it's a lot easier probably, right, if we just list these rules to follow and, and we can feel good about walking in the right direction. But, you know, we're really focusing on uh, extra biblical things that we are to do or not to do instead of who we are, you know. Yeah, and so we're like, looking to ourselves, like really, instead of looking yeah. to Christ. But, um, you know, one of those rules um, that they teach, um, and this is from John Piper, he says that to the degree that a woman's influence over a man is personal and directive, it will generally offend a man's good God-given sense of responsibility and leadership and thus controvert God's created order. So nowhere do we see this in scripture. I mean, in fact, we see women giving influence, having direct and personal influence over men all the time in scripture. And yet here we have this rule of, you know, we're actually um, controverting God's created order. If a woman gives any kind of direct or personal guidance to a man. And so then they take that and they get into all kinds of weird categories like, um, you know, what if a woman is strength training too much? Or, or what if a man gets lost in a neighborhood somewhere and horror of horrors, the only person that he can find to ask directions from is like a housewife <laughs> outside. And of course, you know, she's always tied to her domestic duties, right? It's a housewife. And um, you know, how is he to ask directions without getting direct and personal guidance? Like, how can he do this in a godly way? Or how can the woman, housewife, who answers the door and is getting a package from the, the mailman, how can she, without, you know, talking about it, make sure that he knows that, you know, how can she affirm his leadership and masculinity in receiving the mail? I mean, it's just weird, bonkers kind of stuff like that gets added. Like you're saying, all these rules become more complicated and more of a burden and, and you can't, you still can't define it. Hmm. Man. You know, there's a lot of insecurity in being human. There really is, and mm. neediness. And uh, I think Satan plays uh, has a field day by using that. You know, I don't know about Dr. Piper. I think he's anointed. He's a little bit religious for me. But, I, but you know, he should have said, this is what insecure men feel when they're around articulate and strong women. And uh, if you feel that, then perhaps you need to repent 
go to Jesus, redefine what it means to be created in the image of God, and then rest in that security, go back to the relation. I'm preaching a sermon. What am I doing? <laughs> Praise <laughs> Let's I'm make up a do collection. That. Besides that, we're running out of time. I'm going to play just as I am for 12 verses. Four, <laughs> yeah. 14. Do it. Yeah. Well, I do want to quickly say that Piper, you know, Dr. Piper has taught many wonderful things and has led many people to the Lord. And I think that's why we have to be all the more careful about just wholly oh, yeah, of course. every single thing. He's a good man, still yeah. a bit too religious for me. <laughs> uh, the name of this book, and you ought to get it for your small group in your church. Uh, it'll stir up some controversy, <laughs> but the discussion will be good for insecure women and insecure men, a place where neither of us need to be if we're a new creature in Christ. for joining us. As always, you have a place at our table. We're hanging out with author and speaker, uh, Amy Bird. And you can, by the way, keep up with her uh, at Amy, that's A-I-M-E-E-B-Y-R-D, amybird.com. And if you do Twitter, at Amy Bird, H-W-T. Amy, I know that um, that you're not uh, at all in the book, that you're not saying that the Bible is not fair or that it's not kind to women, that it's our application of, of particular scriptures that is. Um, so I'm not even going to ask that question because I already know the answer to that. That's not what you're saying. But if it's all, if it all falls on us as believers in the church to, for lack of a better term, come up with the right application. Aren't we just like doomed? I mean, we can't agree on the right kind of grape juice to buy for communion. <laughs> you know, how on earth are we going to deal with, you know, you think about all of the denominations and churches and all of that. Where on earth are we going to go to? I mean, I'm old. And I've been hearing some of this stuff, you know, about the issues as far as women and all this kind of stuff. And and to be honest, there's just I mean, I feel like to a certain extent, it's like I, I say I just give up. You know, I mean, there are some things that are just not ever going to be different. I mean, when we get to heaven, we're going to find out. But I mean, where, what do we how do we even approach this? Well, I write books. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I hope that that gets people talking. I hope, you know, my, my desire is for leaders of churches, you know, they're actually my, my t target audience because I want them to lead discussions in their church. I have like discussion questions after each chapter. Um, and I'm hoping that they're going back and digging in scripture, you know, and, and what I address in that chapter and, leading those discussions and hey they might not agree with with me on all my points but this is a great way to lead the discussion go back to scripture and um into their confessions of their faith and then have those discussions in the church because i do think that you know while we we aren't going to get it all right um i do think we need to be growing and learning and that god is calling us to do that and so you know, that's one, one of my answers. And the other one is just that instead of looking to man and looking to woman, we need to look to Christ, you know, and that's where it begins. And really that's where this whole man, woman thing unfolds because you know, we are telling the story of a bride and a bridegroom. We're telling the story of the spousal love of God for his church. And that's exactly what our sexuality is doing. So um, I think that, you know, we first need to aim our eyes and our gaze towards Christ and his love for us. And um, we see that all throughout scripture. You know, it begins with a wedding. It ends with a wedding. 
It has our you know major prophets. We've got Jeremiah and Hosea and Ezekiel all talking in terms of God's people being the bride. Um, and then we've got in the middle of scripture, the song of all songs that is an allegory of Christ's love for his people, exclusive love for us. And then we have Paul in Ephesians telling us, don't you get this great mystery that, um, you know, marriage is, is actually pointing to something much greater. Um, it's, it's pointing to Christ's love for his people. So I really think that we need to, you know, direct our gaze there for there first and our desires there first. And then overflowing from that, we're going to, everything else will kind of fall into place. Have you, has the book been out long enough that you have had the opportunity to hear from anybody yet? It may take a while, but hear from anybody yet who wrote and said something along the lines of, you know, I didn't want to read this. I, you know, I think you're a heretic or whatever, but I've, I've read it and, and wow, I'm, I'm seeing some stuff here that I haven't wanted to see, or I have never thought about or anything like that. I have. And as a matter of fact, there's been a lot of poisoning of the well from, you know, some of those within the um, organizations that I'm critiquing teaching out of. And, um, and so they've said horrible things about me, you know, that I'm dangerous, guard your churches and guard your families. And she's trying to, you know, put women in the pulpit and she's, you know, going to lead to this and, and men and women having affairs because they're, you know, behaving as friends towards each other and, and all of Dogs this. Dogs and um, cats getting together. And, <laughs> and, you know, and yeah. And so, so many people have, have, you know, read the book and been like, I don't understand this critique. Like your book isn't saying any of that stuff. And, and you're not trying to recover from the Bible by any means that, that it's just pointing out that, you know, just because you put the word biblical in front of it doesn't mean that it's true. We have to have critical thinking and uh, read with understanding. And, you know, even if they don't agree with, you know, all the points in the book, I, you know, I've, I've gotten some really good feedback on, on that side of the, thing, of the table great. saying that they have, you know, definitely opened some more doors and how they think. That's great. Cause I think, I think most of the time, Unfortunately, when people write something that is potentially as controversial as this, you have people who are clearly, you know, on, in this case, on your side and people that are clearly are not. But it's like when you start getting something that, you know, people on one side that start to, starting to move and starting yeah. to understand that that's just superb. I would love to see more of that instead yeah. of the polarization. By the way, if you're watching this or listening on the radio stations, uh, you hear a gentle woman who is irenic and kind, and she hasn't said anything yet. Maybe the next segment that would <laughs> cause anybody to stand up and make an obscene gesture. I mean, this is good stuff, and it's about <laughs> Jesus. And there'll be more of it on the other side of the break. And if you don't come back, you're just sexist. <laughs> So glad you're with us. This has been a fun and informative time. And by the way, we now have a free Key Life app that's available. John Myers has worked for months and months along with some others in getting this up. And it is so cool, I can hardly stand it. If you don't have it, you ought to get it. You can get it at any of the iPhone or Android stores. Be sure and check it out. Just go to keylife.org slash app. Um, I'll jump in here real quick because it's <laughs> driving me crazy. Um, I don't always get the books ahead of time. So this one I got to skim through a little bit. And the page that caught me, and you, you referred to this briefly earlier, is, is the dedication. It says, to my husband, Matt, who never cared for yellow wallpaper. I have to know what that means. I mean, you gave him a whole page. <laughs> <laughs> you read three more pages, you would have found out. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I read. <laughs> yeah. So I guess I should refer uh, back to this yellow wallpaper analogy that I'm using. And so the author of the book, The Yellow Wallpaper, it's a very short story. 
um, is Charlotte Perkins Gilman. And so what happened to her was that she had postpartum depression, but at the time that wasn't a diagnosable, um, thing. And so she writes, well, let me just say, she goes to the doctor and at the time the doctor, this guy kind of pioneered this new, um, diagnosis of neurasthenia, which is like a a nervous disorder saying that, um, our bodies aren't keeping up with the modern pace. And so it was very gendered though. For women, the, the diagnosis for treatment was rest treatment. She was to be taking, taken away from any kind of thinking and society and socialness and, um, intellectual stimulation and people. And, the man, however, for his cure was to kind of like go out West, do push-ups, and do a bunch of manly things, ride horses. And so um, when she was prescribed this rest treatment, you know, as a writer and a thinker, um, it drove her like mad. And she did have the clarity of mind to see that this is actually making me worse. So um, her response is to write this novella, which is this fictional quote unquote story about a woman like her, except for she's married to the doctor. And it's all under the guise of care. Like he takes his wife to this kind of abandoned um, plantation and um, she's kind of made to stay in this room that had all this crazy yellow wallpaper in it. Um, And so she's not allowed to write. She's not allowed to be with her child or any of their friends or do anything intellectually stimulating. And she's supposed to get better. But of course, she's getting worse. And so she's sneaking away and writing without them knowing. And that's what the book itself is, is kind of her stream of consciousness. And you're seeing her going crazier and crazier to the point where she actually thinks that there's a woman trapped in the yellow wallpaper. Um, and so it becomes her goal to peel away (laughs) this wallpaper and let the woman out. And so I'm kind of using that same metaphor. Like back then it was a metaphor of like the patriarchal structures, um, that governed a woman's social life, medical care, um, and career and all, and all these other things, married life. Um, and I'm using it more as, you know, yeah, there's still this patriarchal structure there and it's more of a, you know, we've come a long way but we still have these blind spots. And so I'm trying to help the church see the quote unquote yellow wallpaper that's still lingering today. And and then in each chapter, I'm wanting to kind of peel that back and reveal like something much richer and more beautiful in scripture. Right. Mm. And you've done that. (laughs) Thank you. And you've done it well. And that's why, you know, you have this crazy cover on the book too of the psychedelic yellow (laughs) wallpaper that's getting peeled back. (laughs) Great design for the cover. Great graphic. Yeah, I thought so too. I was happy with Good it. Stuff too. How do you react when people come at you? Uh, oh man! I mean, do you um, do you react quote like a man and get a gun, or do you <laughs> react, well, I don't own a gun. I like do a own woman nunchucks. and smile. <laughs> Love it. Nunchucks and bourbon. We have a problem. Um, so it just depends. Um, you know, there's going to be jerks on the internet, you know, there's going to be jerks everywhere, but, um, I do push back, fight back, um, when they are church leaders, because when there's church leaders going publicly on the internet, um, you know, verbally abusing, harassing, or trying to call ahead of my speaking engagements and, you know, collectively do things to sabotage my Amazon page, um, things like this. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm particularly if it's in my denomination, I want to call it out. I want it to be exposed. No, I don't want to do that same behavior back to them. (laughs) I don't want to name call. I don't want to do those things. Um, On my better days, I don't. So, um, you know, I've had to do. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm I'm human. But, um, you know, so on my blog, I have confronted and and kind of kept the story going. There's been a whole uh, website called genevencommonscreenshots.com that has like exposed a whole Facebook group uh, full of hundreds. It was like up to 1,100 people who were like a lot of them church officers um, just saying all these awful things. And um, it shows, you know, how how bad it has gotten. So, you know, it's straight up misogyny and there's racism in there and everything else. But um, so... What's happened with that then is I've also tried to follow through with this in an ecclesial way. So I'm part of a Presbyterian church. So there's a process um, 
in the like church courts kind of on some of this, but that's really revealed um, the weakness of the process, how hard it is to remove abusers and leadership how the process itself comes at the cost of the victims, how painfully slow that is, how, uh, you know, there's a lot of undertones of these views about men and women um, in church leadership. So I've been through a lot in the last year. (laughs) Um, Were you uh, shocked and surprised or were you, was your view of fallen human nature just affirmed? (laughs) Um. You know, I've become pretty cynical (laughs) through dealing with a lot of this. But, you know, when I was writing the book, a professor friend of mine, um, he said to me, you know, what is it that would be hurt you the most if you lost it? Because I think you really need to think about that. Um, And, you know, I thought about some of that. And, you know, I'm there in a lot of ways. You know, I've lost friends. I've um, I've lost my reputation in some ways. Um, and I've, you know, it's, I've had a, a painful experience in my own church because of it. Um, I love my church and we're growing through this, but um, one of my own elders was in that group. So, you know, we've had to, we've been through a lot and it's been, you know, you mean if the worst kind of betrayal. It's been very vulnerable, you know. If you'll give me a list of names, I'll pray for their deaths. <laughs> I have been pretty successful with that kind of prayer in the past. It's and true. Be glad to help if you. I'm kidding. Don't send letters. Yes, I know. <laughs> but you know, repentance. It's just so sad to see how hard it is for church leaders to actually repent. And that's where the power is. We don't go there. Do we're... we believe the gospel? Amy, I'm sorry you've been through that. I hope it gets to be less. And I certainly appreciate you taking your time to spend it with us. Uh, Thank you. It's it's been a pleasure. uh, And for what it's worth, it's been a pleasure for us, too. You go, okay? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Guys, we'll come back in a minute and tell you who we're going to do it unto next week. Don't you dare go anywhere. You know, we yell at each other way too much. And uh, you meet somebody like Amy, that a lady, and we have a list of women and men who have been canceled by a certain Christian culture. And when you talk to them, you find out they're not saying things that you they told you they were saying. They're not going places they told you where they were going. A number of years ago, Jill Briscoe, Briscoe, who uh, we served on some boards together and were friends and still are, although a hard time. Jill, uh, I was kidding her about some feminist stuff. (laughs) I do that. And sometimes I just think, why don't you just shut up? Quit saying it. People read it wrong, and then they already don't like you, and they're going. You're going to get killed if you don't shut up. And I never have, but I was kidding Jill, and she didn't get upset or anything. She was laughing, and then she got serious, and um, she came over to where I was, and she said, "Stephen, women can't. Women can't uh, get what God has given us." by yelling and screaming and kissing, kicking and spitting and cussing without violating the essence of our faith. And then she put her finger and touched my chest and said, it's up to you, Buster. That's a lot of years ago, and I've thought about it, not just there, but in a whole lot of areas in the radical grace teaching and the way Jesus loves people that we want to kick out of the kingdom. 
the way we're supposed to live in loving and kind and ironic ways. Um, I thought about what she said and, uh, and God has, and I think he was crazy, given me some platform, not a gigantic one, but at least a platform. And he's given all the guys on this broadcast and this video a platform, too. And uh, so it's up to us. And if you're listening and you're a leader in the church or you're, uh, you're uh, looked up to by some people in your church or you're a pastor or a professor, uh, I would say with Jill, <laughs> it's up to you, Buster or Busty or whatever. I'm losing it. It's time to go. Hey, listen, <laughs> we're going to come back same time, same place next week. And it's our fond hope you join us then. And between now and then, don't do anything we wouldn't. And that gives you a wide, wide berth.